welcome everybody. Uh, before we start the meeting, the Village of Amor would like to open our meetings by recognizing the many indigenous peoples of our area, including the following First Nations, with communities that are located in the region that we now know as Metro Vancouver. It would be the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam. Further, we'd like to honor the many, the important place in history occupied by the many pictorial features of these lands and waters around us since time immemorial. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Could I get someone to move the recommendation that the agenda be approved? Second, all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Uh, I'd like to say that we have new microphones on order. We are hoping to have them tonight. We will hopefully by the next meeting. So they're coming tomorrow. Well, hopefully that'll fix all our problems. We've been told that. So anyway, thank you for your patience. Uh, public input. Uh, anybody like to bring up anything uh, regarding that's on today's agenda? Nope, okay, I'll move on to delegations. Uh, we have Suzanne Wilson, accredited trainer and business operator to present the Heart and Stroke Foundation's Cardiac Crash CPR course overview. And I had the pleasure of meeting with uh, Susan on our uh, Coffee with the Mayor. Thank you again for coming and welcome. Thank you. If you can't, the blue button should be on the microphone. You push. Okay. There Hi there. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. This is even further. Okay. Um, anyways, my name is Suzanne, and I am. I have been an Anmor resident for 25 years, and my passion and profession is cardiac nursing. I teach at the bedside at Royal Columbian but I also teach CPR in the hospital. And Heart and Stroke Foundation reached out to me um, last year and asking me if I wanted to check out their new program. It's called Cardiac Crash. It's teaching people with no medical experience CPR, basically hands-only chest compressions. And after watching the trailer to Cardiac Crash, I was blown away and jumped on board. I went out and got mannequins, AEDs, and was ready to get going on this. I've taught probably about 80 people out of my home, my neighbors, my friends, family, because I feel like every person should know CPR. In the past four short months or so, um, we've lost a couple residents. And I just feel like the time is now for us to really take a look at cardiac crash, CPR. Um, I would love to have this opportunity to teach here in this beautiful hub and just help people try to save a life. Um, the trailer to this is really impactful and I would love three minutes to show it to you guys because it really sells itself. Um, and then I'll just talk to you for two minutes after that. Okay? Is that right? Yeah. Is that good? Sure. Is yep. that okay with everybody? Okay. Am I okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we're really coming together as a team and making sure that we actually get what we <gasps> Each day in Canada, Almost 100 people will experience cardiac arrest outside of a hospital, and the vast majority of them will die. Many of these deaths could be prevented with CPR, but often people are afraid to act, or they're not sure what to do. Change is needed. That's why the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada made Cardiac Crash Monica. It's an interactive CPR film with a matching film in French. It follows Monica and a friend as they fight to save a co-worker's life. Opposed by colleagues who think they shouldn't try CPR or use an AED because they're not medical professionals. It's a new approach to empowering people to save lives because it uses drama to make learning more realistic and accessible to all. The film is intended for groups of people watching together. The instructor splits the group into two teams, and they compete for points by answering questions and doing hands-only CPR. Shock advised. 
Don't touch patient. No, 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 no. Monica, Monica, no, Monica, Monica. What, what, what are you doing? Please don't do this. Don't Monica, do let's Monica. Do So, what do you do? That's right. Wait for the ambulance. She's gonna go to time. I have to do it now. Right now. Monica, no, phone it right now. Please don't do it. Cardiac crash Monica throws you into the chaos of a real emergency. So you don't just learn CPR. You learn to overcome your fears, and you remember what you learn. In the end, everyone wins, because they've all learned how to save a life. I think you just saved your life. <sighs> Recent published research tested the cardiac crash approach with 400 school students. The study found that the cardiac crash approach led to noticeable improvement in CPR skills and most importantly, retention. The study called this a new era in CPR training. In English and French, Cardiac Crash Monica is an innovative, fast-paced film designed to reach more people in an engaging and dynamic way. I really love the video and how it like showed us a real life. I guess I'll just go through the review and so I'll hold off on that. Um, the 2023 reported that Canada had 60,000 cardiac arrests and less than 10% of the people survived. So I just really want to help to make that those stats a lot better. Um, I just wanted to propose that to you and um, say thank you for listening. I know the, the building's maybe not ready up to be up and going, but when it is, um, I'd love the opportunity to come in here and teach the community. Okay. I want to thank you for coming, and I really want to thank you for the time we spent uh, having coffee, and I really enjoyed hearing your story and your passion for, for it. Um, you know, two of my friends here have had have had issues, and one of them just got out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open up for council to ask any questions. Oh, yeah, I know sure. I asked it a lot of questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Councillor Weber. Yeah, it goes without saying that I totally support this, and uh, this is the exact kind of thing that I think we envision for this facility. Um, we can make this community safer. I mean, we have an amazing fire department. I've spoken about it before. They saved my life. I'm one of the um, 10 percent that lived when I had a cardiac arrest uh, two years ago. But, you know, if, if there weren't enough firefighters around to respond, it would have been really good to know that maybe my neighbors would have known CPR. I've taken CPR several times. It, it's, it's muscle memory. I mean, you, you learn it enough times, you know what to do. And I think that's the key thing, is not to be afraid to react and, and try and save a life. Because you doing nothing will guarantee that the life will not be saved. So I Absolutely. totally support this. I think it'd be a great little test program for um, uh, something that we can do in our village hall, and this is what we built this for. And I think it's, it's a great thing, and I fully support it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Councillor Cryer. Thank you, uh, and thanks for coming. You're welcome. Uh, I agree with Councillor Wevering. It's, I, I would take it. I think we should require staff to take it. I think that we're all looking forward <laughs> We're all looking forward to the time when we can actually have events here. Uh, and I am keeping in touch with Ms. Elric about uh, bringing groups in and uh, we have some work to do ahead of us. Uh, and hopefully we'll be seeing something at the council table soon. And I'm assume you, I assume you wanna do this soon. I, I yeah. would wanna do it yesterday, yes. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing it out of my house, like I said, just to families and friends, mm -hmm. but whenever it's ready, I'm ready yeah. to roll. Is it a, you said you received the call from Heart and Stroke Association. Is yeah. this, like, do you work for them or yeah. is so this? So basically I'm an accredited trainer of Heart and Stroke Foundation's cardiac crash, also basic life support, several things because I'm a nurse at the hospital. Okay. But heart, um, cardiac crash is through Heart and Stroke Foundation. So yeah, it's, it's through them. Okay. So you basically, um, I don't get paid from Heart and Stroke Foundation. Mm -hmm. 
I paid to be able to use the video, I paid to get insurance, I paid for all of my mannequins and everything. So what I was gonna propose, like to, for anybody that came to my class, I would probably charge $20. And you will leave here with the knowledge of what to do if you saw somebody with a card yet, but you will leave here after being on these incredible mannequins where lights come on if you're not deep enough, fast enough, stuff like that. And the use of an AED. Very so, valuable, yeah. yeah. Um, I think right now we're struggling with the fact that we don't have anyone dedicated to doing events. In uh, We have Sabina, but she's working on putting proposals together and uh, to, to do things on the weekends or when the, the hub is closed, we're, we're, we're quite a ways away from that. So I don't know if it's something that you're thinking about doing during business hours or nights, weekends, or? You know, I, I do shift work, so I would do wherever the need is. If I put it out there to community and people said, oh, there's a bunch of people at 12 noon that can, perfect. Weekends, evenings, I'm all over the place. Yeah. All right, well, that's great information. I know that uh, staff is working on something right now, and I've been a part of some of those discussions. Okay. Uh, I formerly had an event management company, so I'm familiar with all of the things that go along with having someone come into a public space and do an event. So right. we're kind of working through those, but okay. it would be great. Uh, it would be a great event to kick things off, so. Thank you. Suzanne, I just wanted to get a few more of the particulars. So you, how many people would you, you do at a time, or would you so train I could at a do, time? So I, I could do up to 40. I have 40? 10 mannequins. Heart, that, that's where max, that's where I would max out. But honestly, the setup is about a half an hour. The cleanup a half an hour. If I was to do, I could even do another group after that. So I could do, like I said, up to 40, as low as eight, but it'd be, I'd rather not do such a small group. I'd rather kind of condense so, a little bit so more. So almost do two classes back to back? I could do that, yeah, but if okay. I, I mean, I have done classes. The smallest class you could do is eight people. Okay. Just the way that this is set up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Councilor Richardson. Yeah, so. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm scared of it. Um, I'm all for it. Uh, if it's the health and safety of Amor residents and people, I would suggest and move that, you know, as part of the hall fees, because there's usually a fee associated with the building, that that would be waived for such things like that. And Sounds really I think nice. it's fantastic. And I was looking around this room, and I see we don't have a defib in this room, which we should have, have, right? We have one in the in the reception. We have one over there. Yeah. But then we should have like a sign or something saying we can waive the hall fee. Anyway, just as a thought, like I'm looking around, and I go, I wouldn't know where to run to get it. So anyway, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Ms. Silver. Thank you. Through the mayor, we do have an AED here at our old building. Um, there was not really a public area to put it in. So we are um, ordering and waiting for the proper case to put it out in the public space so that it's not just, right now we just have it like in a handheld case that we use it. It's at the front counter or we have not used it, but that we can use it. But um, there's a special case that's kind of like a fire extinguisher case that you would break to use it. And, and we have ordered one of those. Councillor Tobridge. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much in support. Um, I echo Councillor Cordero's comment that we're not quite set up to manage these things. So if it was possible to do it during opening hours, it would help staff be able to open the building, close the building, admit people, etc. We are moving toward being able to do that after hours on weekends and evenings. And that will be something we can do, but I don't think we currently have the manpower for that, but would very much like to work with you on this. I, I think it's the right thing for our building. Sounds great. Well, and so I just wanted to thank you again for coming. You're and welcome. I think, uh, as I said, I thought it'd be a, a lot of support. You know, it, if we could save a, a life in one of our residents, how, how great a, an opportunity, you know, that would be. So um, I think what we should do, if we can do it during the week, let me work with staff, and then I'll get back to you, Suzanne, sure. and we'll yeah, that see. Yeah, sounds wonderful. And we'll see what we can we can figure out. But again, there is a bit of a process with 
where we're at right now. So it would probably be something where at the beginning of April, it would probably be something in May, I would imagine, that before anything could sort of come forward. But I'll, I'll keep in contact with you. And thank you again for coming You're out and, and bringing this to us. Yeah, thanks very much for listening. Okay. I'm going to turn that off. Okay. Okay, we now have our second delegation, which is Juan Pablo. And thank you for coming, and thank you for coming and having coffee with me and joining me. That was a, we had a, a great time. Perfect, can you guys hear me? You may... You're working better? That's better, yeah. Perfect, no, thanks a lot for the invitation. It was a great opportunity to talk to you and try to explain what Torca does. I'm, I'm an Anmore resident, and I'm, I'm very excited on what we can do to contribute in, in Anmore community. So, is it possible to go full screen? Or? There we go. Perfect. So Torca, for all of you, I'm not sure how much you know about Torca, but it's a, it's a charity organization that it maintains trail systems in the Tri-Series. It's called Tri-Series Off-Road Cycling Association. It is primarily an off-road cycling association. However, we support all trail users. We don't make exclusive mountain bike trails. There are for hikers, for dog walkers, for trail runners. We want to have a, a big group, a big community and support all trails and maintain them and build them safe and build them sustainable for the long run. What we want is to be able to build trails that will stay forever and not become a danger that have to be turned down. So yeah. Here are some examples on what we do for the trails. I don't know if you guys have seen in, in Bird Plain Park, but there, there is a few trails and we put signage and they're clearly marked. And we do trail days during the year where we take trails that have roots or rocks or, or are becoming dangerous and we fill them in and we create the proper berms to be able to make them better. Here are some examples of community trail building, trail building days. So in 2023, we had eight trail days. Some were sponsored from the community, some were pri sponsored by private companies. We had 185 people registered and we spent about 680 volunteer hours making the trails better. We got special grants to be able to fund the specific trail works. We hired a, a summer crew that was maintaining a specific trails in Upper Eagle Mountain. This is an example of, of the summer trail crew. I don't know if you guys have been on the Upper Eagle, but they have done a tremendous work. There is a trail called Mossam Creek that they just rebuilt and they redo the bridges, the berms. It's, it's looking very nice. We also organize events in, in the cities for kids, where women only groups. We have beginners, we have races, we have cross country events. There is events for all the family, uh, like a kid friendly poker ride. We also do social nights and movie nights. And our goal is to like strengthen the community. These are some stats about the main, main riding areas that, that Torca supports. So Burke Mountain, Eagle Mountain, and Burke Flint Park. Sorry, the numbers are not easy to, to see from here, but let's say Burke Flint Park that is closest to us gets around 2,000 rides a year. And those are tracked with an with application called Trail Forks that gathers like the GPS data from those. And the community, it's big, but we want to we wanna grow more. We have around 760 members and growing. Unfortunately, from Anmor, it's only 16 people that we know are registered from Anmor to Torca. And I think it's probably because we don't see many Torca trails around here. But uh, 
could be our goal is to grow the community and get some trails built in in, in Almor or maintained by Tolka in Almor. Okay, for 2024, we want to continue with what we have been working on, do trail days, races, social rights, do youth rights, women rights. We want to introduce also e-bike rights that are helpful for a different demographic. We want to create long-term agreements with landowners, with the uh, cities, so that we can actually maintain our trail for the long run. This is a snapshot of the main riding areas. Let me see if I can use the pointer. Yeah. So we got Eagle Mountain that we maintain all the trails above the power line. We got Verflin that we maintain the North Stars and some of those trails. And there is a large section in, in Bork Mountain as well. I want to zoom in a little bit on the Anmore area. There we have Verflin Park. One of the ideas that I have is for Torca to be able to work on the Eagle Bluff South, the Lower Eagle, Eagle Bluff South and Eagle Bluff North. Currently, those trails are maintained by BC Hydro. However, they're not really maintained to a, this, we can work with BC Hydro to be able to start a conversation to see if Torca can support those trails. These are examples of, of, of the bridges, the conditions that they are right now in, in Eagle Bluff. Yeah, another, another discussion that we had was about the pump track that we saw, it was on the city council a few months ago. We think it's a tremendous idea and we have a lot of experience working with, we know stories about cities and we have ideas, suppliers that build pump tracks with a very good quality. And we have examples from Chilliwack, from Nanaimo, that are like world-class pump tracks that have been built by these companies. So it's, when they're built, they really don't require a lot of maintenance when, when they're done with asphalt and you don't need a lot of equipment and it's for all categories from kids to adults. It's, 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 it's a great place to bring the community together that I was really, really interested when we saw that it was a proposal for Spirit Park. Yeah, there is examples here when, when Nanaimo, they built their, their track with Velo Solutions, which is a company that we know from, from Squamish that builds this professionally. But once you build it with them, they can even become part of the, like the Red Bull world tour of, of pump track events. So it could be a way to bring some tourists as well when we partner with a company like that. Yeah, these are more examples from Chilliwack, from Mission. We have a, a cost estimate from Velo Solutions and they say it's around $170 per square meter. This is a number that came from them with an, for an asphalt pump track. There are ways to reduce cost and, and that's where Torca is really good at. We have a footprint in the area. When we do a trail building session, we can call for volunteers for work. We have partnership with builder that might be able to collaborate with the material with equipment, things like that. So there are there are ways around it. And yeah, Velo Solutions, why we endorse them? They're, they're a world leader on, on making these uh, pump tracks. They know how to make them safe. They know how to make them with good standards that will stay for, yeah. Yeah, just one problem, just cognizant of time. If you could start to wrap it up a little sure, bit. Sure, yeah. I'll, uh, cause I'll, I'm, I'll open it up for some questions I'll, as well. I'll, I'll stop right now. Yeah. I yeah. just wanna say other ideas that I, I think we can work with the, with the Parks and Recreations Committee, mapping all the, the trails, create a connector trail potentially to the middle and, and secondary schools, staging areas, working with Bonson Lake, that's it. That's, one of the, one so of the right. things I noticed, um, right, uh, the, the level of trail networks that you have is far superior than what we have, which would be great. And, and my recommendation is going to be to put a referral that you come and, 
and present at the Parks Committee and have a wholesome discussion on on your ideas and, and, and stuff like that. But I will open it up for Council and Councillor Weber, who does a little bit of mountain biking himself. So, so I'm well versed on Torca and the quality of trails that you guys do. Um, when I was the Parks Committee Chair, it, we had discussions about partnering with you guys. And if I'm not in the hospital on a Monday, I'm up on your trails on Mondays. <laughs> I, I've right. committed to riding every Monday. And you can tell Steve Sheldon, I hate Imby. I can't even do it on an e-bike, okay? <laughs> it's that hard, but it's a great trail. Like the work that went into that trail and physiotherapy is just amazing. The Mons are all uh, unbelievable and Mawson Creek is incredible. Uh, my son even met someone from France that flew from France that had heard about this area and was impressed beyond belief of what you guys have done. And, and you guys do do better trails than what a lot of municipalities do. Yeah. I, I hope there are some uh, opportunities, future um, developments for perhaps the hillside where some of your trails could be incorporated. And if you could get involved with our pump track, if we go that direction, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yes. we're here to help. So yeah. We're no, and, and thank you for the work you guys do around here. You've just made the Tri-Cities that much better of a place because of, because of your hard work. Yeah. And, and there is and a lot of potential. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of embraced by, you know, Coquitlam and Port Moody as well to the work that you guys do, which is really great. You work very collaboratively with the municipality. So. Councillor Trowbridge, who is our parks chair? I think, I think it's the absolute honor that we have here to have you here. This is just amazing. You've been one of our choir members for many years there. And I'm really proud that we've come to the next trail and making better. I was just having had the know how all the neighbors so I'm very happy I can be on that one. Yeah, no, it's perfect. We love you. Miss Oates, do we need to do a resolution or just direction to this? Yeah, I think Miss Shell's raising her hand. She may have a recommendation. Sure. Uh, that council refer the Torca presentation for trail development within Anmore to the Parks and Recreation Committee. I'll move that. Second. Any dis further discussion? See none. All those in favor? Thank you very much, Thank Pablo. So much. Thanks for coming out. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting held on March 19th. Can I get someone to move those minutes? Second. Those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Any business arising from those minutes? Uh, consent agenda. Anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? Nope. Can I get someone to move the consent agenda? Moved, seconded. All those in, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Uh, we're now on to zoning bylaw review. Coach houses. Report dated March 27, 2024, for a manager of development services attached. Mr. Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so before you tonight, uh, this has been a long time coming out, I would say. Uh, we've done a lot of reviews of a, of a coach house, so we finally can draw it back for first reading, uh, potential first reading of the, of the bylaw for your consideration tonight. Um, so uh, cast your mind back all the way back to June 6, 2023, regular council meeting, where council directed staff to amend the current zoning regulations regarding coach houses to make recommendations on how to make coach sizing easier to understand and regulate and atta the attached bylaw amendment represents staff's recommendation to the council. So uh, just give you an idea of what we've been up to. Uh, so over the past year, staff have met with council and the APC for the advise advisory planning commission uh, members to review the zoning bylaw in relation to coach house allowances. But further clarification and input was required by staff to update the zoning bylaw. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment attached has defined the feedback uh, by these bodies and staff to incorporate some updates to the bylaw to bring the municipality in compliance with the provincial housing bill 44 as it relates to small scale multi-family housing. So we call small scale multi-family housing SMU because it's an easier mouthful than uh, the last two here. Uh, and the SMU requirements uh, are directly linked to bill 44. So those of you who may or may not know, bill 44 is uh, the housing bill that brought forward by the provincial government to try and increase housing stock across the province. And there are, uh, it's a lengthy document. Um, there's there's legi legislation behind the document. Um, however, 
within Anmore, we only really have to apply for part one or part package A, sorry, of the regulation because we are not within the undergrown boundary and uh, we're less than five yards from it. So we kind of only have to apply for part A. So I've taken the section part A uh, straight out of the, regu the regulation policy and copy and pasted it for your information here tonight. Um, generally, uh, section A of Bill 44 uh, refers to allowing the maximum of two units, uh, sorry, a minimum of two units uh, in any residential zone uh, within any municipality in the, in the DC. Um, they've looked, this is uh, one of the pieces that we need to find a little bit more clarification from our lawyers when we look at recommendations against the word shall and must. We, we've been in, re in seminars which have kind of more or less recommended that, a rec that the word recommendation is a shall in this policy document. So we've tried to hear on that side of things and uh, make sure that we, we made a recommendation or at least move some relaxations in relation to this policy document. In, in its entirety, a lot of it we already adhere to. Uh, some things that we don't adhere to in Bill 44 right now within, uh, within our RS1 zone in particular is uh, setbacks. Most of our setbacks are actually way larger than what is requested within the SWOOV uh, recommendations. Um, however, I, I think that there is some questions of health safety in relation to setbacks uh, within the recommendations of this bylaw. One of them being fire separation between our buildings is that if we went down to the small uh, separations that we were requesting, I have a question from a health and safety perspective of we don't actually have the fire flows fire flows currently recommended by the FUS, which is the fire and rider study, to provide maximum flows because we want separation between buildings to stop the spread of fire and rider. So there are and some things which we were not. And Mr. Boyd, if I can just, uh, just to clarify, it, they're talking about 1.2 meters between right. or from the edge of a property to the property line. So houses could literally be six feet apart. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, it, no, they would be 1.2 and 1.2, so it would be 12 feet. No, hold on, that's wrong. Eight feet, eight feet. Eight feet. Yeah, eight feet. They would look very much, they would very much like countryside. Yes. Okay. Yes, in all ways. Because um, I do notice through your report, you go to meters and then you go to feet. And I, I we've said this before, we know what an acre is in feet. I yes. don't know what it is in I, meters. So if we could stick to one, maybe feet, if you could, just rough. My, my apologies. I've actually made some comments as I've gone through my report. Knowing okay. Which word I okay. Can, um, so, uh, s some other ones which were more or less in compliance with was maximum height. Our maximum height within our bylaw was 10 meters. They're recommending 11, so a small increase in that size. Um, and, and the main reason behind that small increase, uh, for us it would be a small increase, other municipalities is larger, is to allow for three stories. And the reason behind it is that the province wants to see less basement suites in the ground and to provide suites which are above ground for, for better living conditions. So that's the reasoning behind the increase. Um, the lot coverage, we fall within the lot coverage. And then <laughs> the other one is off-street parking requirements. They're recommending only one uh, stall per uh, residential area. Now, I, I, would, I wouldn't make a comment that they, they recommend one. It doesn't mean you have to build one. I think within Anmore, in our community, the, recommend the, the, the market would dictate that more than one stall will be built by, by most homeowners because we have larger lots and most people know that you need to provide parking in order just some clarifications on, on the SWOOV end. Okay, uh, now back to really the, the, the report at hand is the section B suites and coach houses. Uh, I know the recommendation was originally just towards coach houses, but with our existing bylaw, coach houses and secondary suites kind of intertwined way too much and it was very hard to distinguish what each of them was by a definition and other areas within the bylaw. So we've tried to disentangle them and put a very clear definition of what a coach house is and what a secondary suite is in the recommendation. Um, and plus there's some other clean up, but I can go through the bylaw in its entirety. Um, so some general uh, uh, regulations, part five. Um, due to the deletion and the replacement of the floor area definition, the bylaw no longer had any exemption for garages. So we've, act we've added in exemptions for garages based upon the size of the lot and a bit of a sliding scale on that. So the larger lots get more uh, parking stalls allowed uh, within a garage compared to a small lot. Um, 
some other specific uh, regulations here. Um, the, we can try to provide some more clarity on the possibility of secondary suites to be constructed uh, with a breezeway to the primary residence, which in essence uh, created a coach house. So what we have in our existing bylaw was that people essentially were building a separate structure and then linking them with a breezeway, so a, a walkway between the primary residence and that other more or less distinct section. And so, but however, it was seen under our bylaw as one uh, primary residence. So what, what we found in, in the past with some building um, reviews was that people were linked with a breezeway with two doors at either end, a lock each door, and now there's eight separate dwellings more or less. So we try to remove that uh, construction. Um. I'm just going to cut you off there because I think before we get into the weeds of what you've proposed here, which I have several ex challenges about, I think we need to stick at the 10,000 foot level right now because when Bill 44 first came out from the provincial government, which was the Housing Supply Act, they said that it excluded properties not serviced by municipal services. They also said that it wasn't in effect with property or municipalities under 5,000 people. So by the changes of what you, they've now, with fine tuning, we need to get a clarification on how this applies to Anmore. And my suggestion is before we get into the weeds and debating the rest of this, we need to find out what exactly they're looking for from the provincial government. And I'll give a few examples. If they're telling us right now that every house in Anmore could have a suite, how is that going to apply to the stratas that don't have a se proper septic facilities to handle? those extra houses, those suites. We have other subdivisions that have covenants, i.e. Ravenswood, that have no suites. We don't have parking for that. The septic systems aren't designed for it. So we need to get some clarity, I believe, from the provincial government as to what rules are actually applying here. Plus, we do also, we purchase our water through Port Moody. We don't know if there's sufficient water to be able to facilitate this. So I think there's a whole checklist that we need to ask them before we go on, on in regards to where we're at with the with the suites and carriage suites. Sure, thank you. There, there, there's definitely some clarifications that we as staff are looking for as well, which is just kind of like, you know, I can give an example within Anmore. Parts of Anmore is actually within the urban center of Anmore. So that clarification for us as well is, well, do we have to apply that drawing? Is Anmore a special case? And within the, the, the legislation, we do understand that if we don't want to comply with something, we actually have to ask for an exemption by a council. So, so we can send that letter to yeah. the CP and ask for it, and then we can then ask for an exemption. However, we're not guaranteed to get an exemption. It is a request, and they, they do it according to the regulations that they have. Yeah, I, I just, to get into the details of suites and carriage suites without knowing the parameters before then, I think is kind of we're putting the cart before the horse in regards that I've got some real challenges here. Uh, for example, Alpine, for example, is a very narrow street. You, if you put suites on it, there is no street parking. Where's that parking going to be facilitated um, before we even get into the suites and carriage houses aspect of it? The stratas as well. You know, we have several stratas here that have uh, communal septic systems that to in you couldn't even expand those communal septic systems. There's not the land to do it. So how is that wastewater going to be going to be facilitated? So, so we have an answer to the strata question. The strata question is that the province has basically said that if you're a strata, a strata can actually, under their own bylaw, limit you. So in reality, stratas can regulate their allowed use. So I think some of our guests quite simply don't have to ask you for it. They could just say through their bylaw it says you're not allowed to use this particular strata. Which, again, I'm challenged with that because a, a strata overruling a municipal government is not is 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 backwards. So I think before we even pursue this conversation, we need to send that letter off and get it drafted and, and send it off and get a response because we're such an anomaly. I think that we need to be able to under they need to be able to understand our story and the challenges that we have. So, you know, we've got several several communal septics that are you know, on very shaky ground. We had one that we had to replace at Anmore Green Estates, which now is a, in the urban containment boundary. So I think it's important that we do that before. And I would just table this right now. I think it's a great report. I look forward to having a ton of conversation about it. I've got a lot of challenges with it. Um, but I think before we get that, we need to find out where, where we're at. So um, 
I'll, I'll open it up for any for Councillor Tolbert. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd like to table it as well because of um, seeming contradictions that I see to it. Um, so I want to be clear. I'm not in opposition to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, it's something I want to explore um, and talk about. But what I'm concerned about is when I look at section two, for example, and one point uh, two point one, there are <coughs> what appear to be contradictions. Um, I'll just read quickly a couple of things. Um, it, it talks about there are no size limits for the lots. Then it goes on to say what size of lot is restricted to what. And <laughs> those two things don't quite mesh. Then it goes on to say less than one hectare in size, so what's that, 2.4, 2.5 something acres um, that are not serviced by sewer operated by local government is, is a no bueno. So I, what I'm concerned about is staff and the village getting into an awkward situation when there is not provincial clarity. So if we can, the, the other thing I wanna be careful about is that we don't push back so hard that they recategorize us into the next, um, as, as we discussed at one point, um, into the next group and all of a sudden there's mandates that, that we can't even digest. But um, I, I just wanna be clear, I'm not in opposition of reviewing this, I think it's well done and I think we need to go through it, but if the direction from the province has inconsistencies, if whatever we enact will fall on us and people will challenge it, which is fair enough, but I want a clear defined answer when challenged, not, oh, well, the province says this and you're doing that and all of that sort of stuff. Plus that, that I think you mentioned it, but table five, it says recommending zoning. Recommend it doesn't mean thou shalt to me. Um, that means it's a recommendation. So we should get some clarity. Yeah. So I, I agree not getting into the weeds, yeah. but that's my view. It is a great report, and it's a report that we've, you know, brought forth from the APC and, and fully discussed in that. So it is, Councillor Weber. Yeah, I kind of agree with that direction. I think there's several different things going on here. There's this provincial requirement. There's the need to update this bylaw, and then there's the whole vision of Anmore Council uh, to speak to it. And I think that there has to be an order of things to happen. And I think clarifying what the government wants, because it is inconsistent, I think that's a good first step, and then we can take yeah. it from there. Okay. So, Michelle, do we need a recommend? Oh, oh, sorry, Karen. Oh, sorry, Doug. Hold on. Before I'll, I'll go to Council Richardson. Yeah. So. I agree with the province in clarification because some of the stuff is fuzzy. But overall, I thought, because I did go into the weeds, I clearly like weeds, I thought the idea of coach houses and sizing is correct. It start, actually started in December or November 2022 when the people came to request because they were limited by the 25%. And I keep going back and forth on it's now been almost a year and a half. How do we get them so they can build something? Because what I just heard from this with the province, it's another half year delay. No, it won't Maybe? be that long. It won't be that long. Yeah, yeah who said that? Well, I'm just assuming to get the province back and then we go through this and council meetings every couple of weeks. Okay, it's at least a three month delay. We've already increased the size of the carriage houses to I think 1,450 square feet. The problem with the carriage house is it can only be 25% of the main house. For clarification, the province has mandated that municipalities must update their zoning bylaw by June 31st. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So I think that's all good, like everything. I've, I've shared some concerns that there's a bunch of other things in here which haven't been discussed at the APC and weren't discussed at the committee as a whole. And I'm a bit surprised that they're in here. Like, for example, registered owners must occupy some portion of the house. I don't even know how you would enforce that. That's kind of a, okay, the dad buys the house and the kids are living there. That's illegal by the bylaw. 
right? So there's, there's things like that. The practicality um, has to be addressed, and there's a bunch of little things that are missing, which I've also shared with you. But since we're not going to go into it, I'll, I'll let it go. But carriage house sizing and suite sizing, the way it was done in here from that sort of 10,000 point view, I think it's the right thing. Ms. Over. Thank you, through the mayor. So if I could suggest that perhaps um, a route to go, um, being that uh, Mr. Boyd just noted that it is mandated that we comply with this legislation by June 30th, that we could parcel out um, the parts of Bill 44 that are included in this by bylaw amendment, um, and then sort of put aside the, the rest, I guess, um, for council's consideration. Um, and in that, we could seek clarification in particular um, from our um, lawyers on how exactly some parts of the legislation that are unclear apply to Anmore. Um, in terms of the recommendations, um, all of the webinars and information sessions that Mr. Boyd and I have sat in on um, with the province, it has been communicated quite clearly um, to the municipalities um, and through questions asked by other local governments that the recommendation is um, actually uh, you shall do this. Um, so that, that was clear, although the wording is recommendation, uh, the messaging was very clear to us. So perhaps if we could deal with the Bill 44 part, um, bring a report back to council related to that specifically, um, with advice from our lawyer and also have our new planner um, dive into this as well. Um, we could then meet the legislative deadline if, if that is uh, appropriate for council to consider. Yeah, I, I think that um, our next meeting is on the 16th, so I think if we can get something back to be able to, a letter to it that we could agree on to get sent off would be, would be appropriate. But until that's done, I'm not comfortable with going through with the rest of this because it, it does all tie in together. You can't separate the two out of this because as soon as those parameters are met, people are going to be wanting to see how it can affect them, their, their own house and stuff like that. So I think we need a clear, I, I think we'll get a fairly quick response. Um, on that and, and I can assure you of that. So I think if we can get a letter as soon as possible back with all the in, in inconsistencies as well as the challenges that we see in Anmore and I don't mind, you know, I think Councillor Trollbridge has brought them up and Mr. Boyd, you brought up some as well and, and that we could get that letter off fairly quickly and get a response back fairly quickly. And, and I do think there have been substantial changes made to it on an individual basis. They did just did one in Parksville regarding the uh, short-term rentals and the impact there, but they are doing some more. Um, they've done a couple things in Bowen Island as well, so. I just to ask for clarification for this yeah. letter. Is it just in relation to package A, to part A, that the, the policy that's been copied and pasted in here, the clarifications required there, or do you want a question raised about part B as well, which is three to four units within urban containment boundary? Well, we're not in an urban containment boundary. We have sections of ammo that are we have, in. We have a section, sure. Yeah. 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 So I think we should uh, get it addressed for both because we do facilitate both. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Trowbridge. Sorry, I don't want to get into it in depth, but if we're going to, and you're saying that table five, Karen, just for clarity, is that's it. It's cement. It's stone. Correct. So we, we, we were going through seminars regarding this and the staff from the province were communicating somewhat clearly to say these are shalls and not really recommendations. Now, I would say that that's not being challenged in court or by lawyers. This was challenged. This was staff to staff saying, hey, here's, here's how we interpret this. So th there's, as we all know, there's, there's clarifications that have either to be sought via the lawyers on if this is a shall or not. Okay, so if I could just make one quick comment for you to think about when you're talking to them. The one section on the chart that talks about maximum uh, lot coverage and it allows for 40% on smaller lots, that is the floor plate of the building as I understand it when you read the legislation. Um, it does not include things like driveways, patios, uh, pools, et cetera, et cetera. So it's conceivable, and this is conjecture, but it's conceivable that wherever the, depending on where the building's placed, 
long driveway with a large patio and a pool or something else could mean that the permeable part of the soil is rendered down to something that could even be only 20% of the lot. And in Anmore, we have a requirement for 20% of the lot to be treed. So we're bumping up against other kinds of issues when you start talking about uh, those those kinds of criteria. And we, you know, we have a lot of concern in the community, um, a lot of positive, but a lot of concern as well about doing something in Anmore South where we're going to have density. But it could argue, it could be argued here that building Anmore South is a lot friendlier to the environment than having 40% coverage on small lots all throughout the village. You, you're correct regarding the coverages and what have you. However, during the seminar that we had with the province, they categorically said, you cannot use tree bylaws to limit coverage within your lot. That, <laughs> so so they, 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 how can I best put it? They are serious regarding these, these requirements and they have tried to ensure that other bylaws can't impede a zoning bylaw as well. So. Again, we're going to ask these questions as, as requested of us. Uh, I think, uh, I suspect they're going to come back and say this is a must and not, not a recommendation. To us. You know, I, I don't necessarily agree with you because I think they're so naive to the fact that we're, we're so close to urban centers, we don't have the, the services to be able to service these lots. And I know um, this, I, just so people realize, right now our zoning is 20% lot coverage for a house. This. Is it 25? Oh, so, so to take 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 it, double it. This is a significant change to Anmore. Significant to existing neighborhoods, where houses could come down, and 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 it would be dramatic. And that's why I think that we need to make sure, and we need to put a very firm letter forward to to the province to say that look, we can't. We 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 agree with your intent. However, we cannot facilitate it through our infrastructure. We don't have the infrastructure to facilitate it. But this is a big deal, and we need a fairly firm letter off. We need to get our lawyers involved in this because, you know, I remember when we did infill. I remember when Ravenswood went in and people went to half acres and they thought the world was gonna come to an end. This is a big, big deal and people don't realize it. And so um, we need to make sure that they are fully aware of our, our resources and our community before they start implicating this and this. And I think it's easy for staff to say, no, this is what it is, but I think that's what it is. So um, I wanted to get the question, so we just move this forward. So uh, do, do you have a resolution, Ms. Chow? Yes, uh, that staff seek clarification on how Bill 44 regulations apply to Anmore specifically and report back to council. Yeah, could I get someone to move that? Moved, seconded, I'll open it up now. Did you have something? Oh, I, mean, I, I think it's another one of these things where this was not written for Anmore. They weren't thinking about Anmore when they wrote this. It's like Metro 2050. You know, you, we, I saw so many inconsistent things in there that, you know, when you think about the Anmore context, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think it's prudent to do that. They, they have to realize that we are a different community. Yeah, good. Okay, see no more. Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed, carrying unanimously. So now we'll move on or to, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, new, new business, uh, 11A. So Tri-City Healthy Community Partnership, uh, letter dated is attached. So I would like to recommend that council appoint Councillor Polly Cryer as council liaison representative to the Tri-Cities Healthier Community Partnership. Can I get someone to second it? Second, or move it? Move it. Second it. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. I'd then like to, uh, we received a letter from the Tri-Cities Regional Food Council attached. I'd like to recommend that council appoint council, Councillor Richardson as council liaison representative to Tri-City Region Food Council. Moved, seconded. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, uh, we're on to the mayor's report. Um, got a few things. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, um, Easter, uh, what amazing success. A big thank you to Sabina 
uh, Perrin, the Anmore Scouts, uh, there was well over 400 people here on, on Saturday at noon. It was, it was, the weather was great, it was amazing. Scouts were doing a, a worldwide jamboree fundraiser. Um, uh, it was just, yeah, we, they got the pavers finished out there. Still a little swampy at the top, but we need to, still lots of work needed to be done in the park. But I will tell you what a great turnout of people and, uh, and the weather cooperated incredibly. So, um, I've had a few complaints. Um, one of them is from a couple residents who have phoned Fraser Health about their neighbor's septic complaints and they're getting absolutely no action. And just so we're clear, the village has no regulations when it comes to septic systems. All we do is when a building envelope comes in, we get a letter from, from uh, Fraser Health or the BC environment stating that they've approved the design of a septic system. The village does not, we do not have the training in it, we have nothing to do it. So the process is, is that residents have to phone Fraser Health, and then they're supposed to follow up with it. And I can tell you that after following up with a couple people, that is not being the case. Now, back in 2021, we asked Fraser Health to come to a meeting here. Um, Blair Coquette was the manager. Um, we discussed this problem back then. Um, and he, he's, his role was the administrative role to review documentation, compliance, and enforcement. So what I would like to um, ask is that we ask him to come back to a council meeting and ask him why these questions or why these complaints are not being investigated or even followed up on. This is a very, very serious thing. We've had issues before where people have just simply tried to put their, their, um, their septic effluent when their field fails into the ditches. We've now had it moving into neighboring properties. I'm not going to be specific about it, but this needs to get addressed and we need to put some urgency in getting this gentleman or somebody from his office here to answer. And so that we can actually, it'd be great to even have a phone number and a card at our front desk. So when people come in and go, I'm a little bit concerned here about the smell of septic and what's being done here, that we can hand them the card and we can be assured that we get a copy of the report back because right now nothing is getting done. And this is a huge environmental issue. So follow up with that. Um, I also uh, heard a couple complaints of people and contractors working on Good Friday. And this is very concerning because people say that they have phoned the, the number uh, at the Village Hall, but there's nobody answering the phone. So I believe that the next long weekend we should actually bring in somebody, one of our bylaw person, um, I realize it's going to be over time and there's going to be a cost for it, but they need to start patrolling. And the only way to find uh, the contractors is by actually the bylaw person being there and witnessing it at the time. Um, and it, it takes a lot of the uh, onus away from neighbors reporting on other things. But it, it's getting very bad and we need to deal with it. And it's not fair to people who have a long weekend and don't want to have a construction site right next to them going on. So. Um, I did talk to um, uh, Scott, our building, our building inspector, and he is um, he is hoping, and I think we need to work on um, maybe doing a bit of an update on our when we have time on our ticketing bylaws, so that we can make sure that these tickets are of a level that actually may not just a tax for working that day, but actually make it as a bit of a penalty for working that day, and the builders need to be notified who are representing them because this is unacceptable. Um, Got a copy here of the um, summer bus schedule. Uh, so starting April 15th, seasonal changes will be happening here. So we in Anmore, we will be getting, uh, I think it's 15 minute service, the 150 to White Pine Beach from Coquitlam Center Station, 179 Bunsen Lake from Coquitlam Central Station, and the 182 Moody Station from Belcarra. All those three buses will be increased as of April 15th for the summer bus schedule. Um, I did notice, and it kind of relates back to our previous discussion, the federal government accelerator funding. Um, Bowen Island received a grant of $1.6 million, which is sh shocking to us, but good for them. Congratulations. But this is to help with infrastructure costs and that, so I'm wondering if we should maybe be applying as well. $1.6 million, although it's not a big number in the federal government's realm of things, it's a big number for us. And if we can get $1.6 million for infrastructure improvements that would accelerate housing, 
I think it's a great thing to do. So I know as um, my role at Metro Vancouver, we have been working actively with them and they haven't given us anything. And so they, they, it was just so weird that they gave it to Bowen Island, which again, completely out of the urban containment boundary, no services and that. So, hey, good on them and we should make sure we apply it. Apparently it's a fairly easy process. Um, and I wanted to just follow up with the, the last thing is last week I was at a CAO regional board meeting uh, and that in Victoria, um, I'll tell you, the, the talk around the thing is the dysfunction on boards and councils. And I'm, I can say that, you know, we're, we are functioning very well. We've got an incredible staff, but I'll tell you, around the province, and we're seeing it in some of the news, uh, you just you don't have to look much further than Harrison Hot Springs or even um, uh, 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 Kamloops. You know, it is, it, is, it is a real, real challenge. And I think, you know, as, as neighbors, as residents, we all have to treat each other with respect. This is not a great job at times. It can be a very rewarding job. But again, you know, always never, never doubt to be able to uh, send out an email to, to council and let them know that you're happy with the job that they're doing or whatever and, and to thank them because again, over the last two terms, there haven't been a lot of people that have ran for council in this community, but a lot of people that ha seem to have a lot to say. So, again, I just wanted to stress that. And then I was also appointed as the uh, uh, trustee for the Municipal Finance Authority again, which was good. We don't need any money for them. But um, and then finally, I just wanted to continue, continue to come and meet with the mayor and have coffee with the mayor. We've had some great meetings so far, great discussions, and I just wanted to thank all those that have come out. And yeah, I can make my schedule. It's it's great. So. Transferred over to council reports. Councilor mm -hmm. Pryor. Oh, sorry. Uh, would you like to uh, make a couple of motions uh, for the delegation to uh, for, from Fraser Health? Yes, please. Okay, that staff invite Fraser Health to be a delegation to council regarding septic systems. And compliance. And compliance. And enforcement. Okay. Okay. Could I get someone to move that? Moved, second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, and that staff be directed to schedule bylaw enforcement on statutory holidays to monitor construction work. Moved. Second, any discussion? See none. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, count, sorry, Councillor Pryor. Yes, thank you, Mayor McEwen. A uh, couple of updates. Uh, we're in full committee table meetings these days. Uh, I have had two healthier community partnership meetings. One was just leadership, council reps, and then the other now, actually it's tomorrow for the entire committee. Uh, foundry, we're moving forward with the foundry, the Tri-Cities foundry, so that uh, at this point in time, I don't have a lot of involvement in, but once it gets up and running, it'll be a great opportunity for our youth to, to get services and get any help that they may need. I thought I had a food council meeting tomorrow at two o'clock, <laughs> but I will attend. It's tomorrow too. <laughs> You're on tomorrow at two. <laughs> I'll send you a note, but I will attend. I already had it in my calendar. Uh, and, I'll, and another meeting I had was the Tri-Cities Overdose uh, Community Action Team, and there were some startling statistics. They always go, um, offline and they, they talk about statistics in the region and I think everyone knows that the drug crisis is growing and, and I think it's good to point out that we are not immune from it. We are lumped with Port Moody but typically there are no deaths in Port Moody and Anmore but last year, 2023, there were two deaths and there were uh, three call outs just in the last quarter of 2023 and they point those out because a call out is typically a life saved. So that's very good when they, um, when that happens. It's also important to note that all of the statistics that, that we get, those are people in their homes doing drugs. It's a, it's um, obviously a misconception when because of the work that I do with the unhoused community. 
that that is where the problem is, but that is not where the problem is. The problem is everywhere. Uh, and, and another growing concern is for the responders, the first responders. It's, it's getting to be uh, difficult for them, especially if they go into a home when they don't get there fast enough and there is no chance to save the person. So I think it's something to keep in mind. I know that the overdose cat will be uh, making the rounds to the council table just to point out a few things and offer people some tips and guides on if they know someone is using drugs and uh, most importantly to not use alone. And that is all. And I was at the Easter Bunny and it was lovely. There must have been about 400 people, beautiful weather. It was a good day. So thank you. Any other? Okay. Councillor Weber. Just to further to what uh, Mayor McCune was talking about. Um, it, I think my personal experience of being on council, I've had some of the best experiences of my life being on council and some of the worst. And the worst were unnecessary. And I think it's sad. It was a sad reflection on this village. There was a time in this village where it was really bad. We were getting attacked. We were getting accused of things based on absolutely no evidence of things we didn't do. It, it was almost like people were like, well, you don't believe what I believe, so clearly there must be something wrong with you or you must be crooked. Um, it is a tough job in that sense. It's a, an enormously rewarding job, but people make it unnecessarily rough. I've grown some fairly thick skin, but every once in a while it still gets to you. When, you. when you're here for the right reason, you're trying very hard. I've been blessed with counselors and, and a mayor that are here for the right reasons. I know that. Um, I don't know how to get that through to people. But the people that, and I think the guilty people know who they are, um, what they have to realize, if they're trying to further democracy and make their council better by drawing more people in, they're, they're doing the opposite because it's scaring people away from running. Um, I expect it to be challenged, not just this last election, but the election before. And really, council was acclaimed once again. So it, 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 I don't know if it's yielding the results that, that people expect, but it's not making for better councils, and I see it in every community. Fewer and fewer people want to get into this job. It's not well paid, but it takes an enormous toll on you personally. So, I, I, you know, I'm just here on my soapbox, but I, I hope people realize that, that what, what municipal councils and people in government in general put into this job. So it, reading this letter from a Soyuz, you know, I get it. Um, it's, it's, it's becoming a problem and it's affecting the function of, of local governments. And that's a sad thing. Um, sorry, that's all. Okay. Move on to our Chief Administer, uh, Administrator's Report. Ms. Elric. Thank you. Um, so first, I am very excited to um, have onboarded our um, full-time planner here at the Village last week. Uh, Josh Joseph has joined us, um, so you will probably um, see him at some council meetings, but certainly uh, he's available for members of the public with any planning inquiries and will um, hopefully lighten Mr. Boyd's load. Um, so that's fantastic addition to our team. Um, also, I wanted to let everyone know that the CC committee meeting that was scheduled for Thursday evening is going to be canceled and postponed to a later date. Um, we're looking to facilitate accommodating a guest uh, to come into the meeting regarding some of the accessibility requirements. Um, so we will be keeping everybody posted when that meeting will be rescheduled. And um, lastly, I wanted to um, just take uh, some time to address uh, a question from the last council meeting um, that was related to some questions on the Ravenswood tree removal um, and just provide um, some clarity to the community on that. Um, so uh, despite the village's repeated messaging related to the required tree removal at Ravenswood and Sunnyside to address both ongoing safety and liability concerns, I would like to take this opportunity to once again provide details about why the trees were removed. We recognize that there have been a mix of posts and misleading information about this tree removal, and many seem to be ignoring the most critical fact. The majority of the trees had to be removed because they were deemed dangerous, 
would be at risk when neighboring trees were removed or were already struggling from drought stress and would likely need to be removed in the future. The entire area posed a safety risk both in terms of wildfire and to people and animals, which is a significant liability risk for the village and a completely unacceptable safety risk for our community. So for the record, here's an overview of what took place and why the trees were removed. First, I would like to say that we value trees in our community, but we also have a responsibility to protect people and animals and, addre and address safety risks when we are made aware of issues. That is what took place here. In fact, the safety issues related to at-risk trees was so severe that when our public works crews went into the area with an instructor who was going to provide chainsaw training on downed trees, the instructor refused to provide the training and ordered everyone out of the area as he believed there were dangerous trees in the area. Based on both the trainer's concerns and as part of a council approved budget to do risk assessment for trees in various areas of village owned land, we brought in a certified arborist in May 2023 to assess the village's lot at Ravenswood and Sunnyside. The arborist noted that conditions on site were more like what would be, ha what would be expected at the end of August rather than mid-May and the following recommendations were made. One, removal of trees marked as high risk that were marked, which was approximately 50 trees. Two, additionally, removal of all trees that interfere with power lines along Sunnyside. Three, recommendations and caution on amount of wood left on site to mitigate increased wildfire risk. Four, consideration of removal of the northern part of the site as the overall health of the trees in that area were in decline, adding that this area was disturbed with bike trails, making the risk higher, and specifically changes made by cyclists to the forest floor to create bike jumps and trails that were causing disturbance of soils and further exasper exasperating the stress of the nearby trees. Five, should some of the trees be retained with only specific removals marked, the arborist recommended planting more drought tolerant species. Six, should only a portion of the trees be removed and a portion remain, a further tree risk assessment should be performed after the area is cleared as trees that have been previously protected by other trees may be at higher risk once sheltering trees are removed. And seven, should only the marked trees be removed, regular risk monitoring should be performed on the remaining trees. It was also noted that other than high risk marked trees, it was identified that most of the hemlocks on that lot appeared to be struggling from drought stress, which also makes them more susceptible to various types of rots that can compromise the strength of the wood. In short, the assessment found that a significant number of trees had to be removed because they posed an immediate danger and most of the remaining trees would also not thrive due to removal of others nearby and the impact of drought on the type of trees and soil conditions. In response, it was determined that the best course of action would be to remove all of the trees. This also made the most sense from a financial perspective as proceeding with a partial removal would still involve most of the trees being removed, but would require additional ongoing assessments and other measures with the note that most of the remaining trees would likely be at risk in the future. At the end of May 2023, a quote was obtained for both the removal of the specifically marked trees at a cost of $17,500 and a quote was obtained for all the trees to be fallen, hauled off site with stumps to be pulled and ground at the cost of $21,875. Within the council approved budget of $30,000 and based on the professional advice provided, high level of health and safety risk to the community, and financial benefit of undertaking the full tree removal, staff authorized the tree removal to proceed after the end of bird nesting season. So again, we all love trees, which is one of the reasons why we work and live in this community, but we are also responsible for ensuring that our community is safe and leaving trees that are at risk of falling or wildfire was not an option. I cannot even imagine the tragedy if someone was seriously injured or killed or we had a wildfire incident in the heart of our community because we failed to do the right thing by removing those trees. We will now be looking at how best to use that land, including potentially replanting trees and other shrubs or greenery that can thrive in the soil conditions on that property. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got some information items, uh, some minutes from the APC committee, uh, some general correspondences. Councillor Weberinka alluded to from the town of Soyuz. 
Uh, now open up for public question period regarding village business. Thank you everyone for coming out, it was a rainy night.